on the YouTube chat. You can directly ask some questions. Um, and before we get, uh, sorry, before we move on to the next talk, I'll just be introducing a little bit of it. So the next talk is by Tam, which is titled Your GitHub Repo as a Crime Scene. So Tam is with us here. I'm just going to check. Yes. Um, I think I will, I think I'll spend a couple of minutes asking Tam a couple of questions about himself if Tam's okay with it. Tam, just give me a thumbs up if you're okay with it. Awesome. So, hey, Tam, nice to meet you. Hello, hello. Hi, I can hear you. Okay, great, thank you. Hello, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, so, Tam, I've heard you are a data engineer. Could you tell us a little bit about what a data engineer does and what your specialities are? Yeah, that's a great question. So data engineering only recently came into vogue, maybe in 2017 or so, uh, where uh, they found out that there's this career path for computer scientists and engineers who uh, do manufacturing, modification, extraction, loading, and transformation on data. Uh, and data, of course, is a, a huge hot, hot, hot button topic. Uh, in the current, uh, you know, in the current information age, uh, and so with a data engineer, you get access to a, a lot of uh, resources uh, to leverage the data that you have access to. Um, and so, like this is, for example, you might have a, a data set that is like uh, across like three different um, Excel files, uh, and a data engineer would take those Excel files plus like any databases that you might have access to uh, and manipulate the connections, manipulate the data to join those all into an integrated data set that allows you to leverage uh, the information that you have for the output of good analyses. Yeah, so uh, as a data scientist, I'm very thankful for a lot of data engineers because they are the ones that provide me with clean data because if, and. And as a data scientist, the worst part about data science, or well, the best part in some opinions, are that you have to spend a lot of time trying to clean your data. And it is these pipelines that enable us to do our work quicker. So from all the data scientists out, out there, thank you. <laughs> I didn't pay him to say that. Just to be clear, I didn't pay him to say no. that. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, you didn't. So yeah, uh, before we begin with your talk, what do you do in your free time? Because I noticed a couple of guitars behind you. Yes, actually, so this is my collection of instruments. Um, I've got a bass guitar, a, a, a guitar guitar, and then uh, two ukuleles. Um, one of them I picked up when I was uh, in Shenzhen and the other one here in Singapore. So I'm actually located in Singapore. Uh, truth be told, I don't really do too much uh, music in my free time. I'm actually uh, more a yoga practitioner. So uh, I am actually a certified yoga teacher and I will teach online often or um, I'm actually school uh, here in Singapore to teach. Yeah, So that's what I actually do in my free time. I, uh, I like doing yoga and actually meditation. So uh, I'm also a uh, teacher in meditation, like Anapanasati in particular. All right, that's great. So I'll leave you alone, Tam, because I think it's exactly, uh, wait, what time is it? It's 8.30 for me. Oh, yeah. it's exactly 3 uh, in UTC. So I'm going to leave you alone, and you can go ahead with your talk. OK, fantastic. Uh, OK, hello, everyone. And it's nice to meet you guys. Uh, my name is Tom. Uh, you can also call me Tam. That's fine. Uh, and uh, yes, again, I'm a principal data engineer at Quantum Black here in Singapore. Just transferred to this office. Absolutely love Singapore, but I'm actually uh, from America originally. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit today about a uh, book called Your Code as a Crime Scene. Uh, so I'm not going to. I will be showing off uh, a few things here. Um, the first thing that I'll be showing off is a, a uh, pipeline that I had built based on the code that I saw that was uh, included in this book, uh, as well as uh, a, a very simple web application that displays uh, the information that the book talks about. So if you can just give me one moment, I'm going to make sure that I can share screen. Uh, great. 
Okay, so I, I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen here. Basically, this is just a uh, <laughs> an Amazon link to uh, the uh, the, uh, the booking question. Um, it's not an affiliate link; it's just the link. Uh, but it's called Your Code Your Code as a Crime Scene. It was written by an author uh, named Tornhill, uh, Adam Tornhill, and he's actually a very fascinating man. He was studying forensics at the same time as he was studying computer science, and so in this book kind of marries these two disciplines to try to figure out how can we use this forensic capability and apply it to the uh, the art of uh, architecture and the art of writing code. Uh, and so there's a lot of fascinating concepts in this book. I highly recommend you pick up a copy. I read this many years ago uh, and it always stuck with me. Um, but the idea here is that a lot of information is uh, lost in your code, right? The actual manufacturing of the code, normally what people see is just the output, right? And so this is where you have your git branches and your, you know, your, your releases or your master branch, developer branch, what have you. Uh, the problem is that you only see the final result of all of the effort that was put into that code. Of course, that means that you lose that information on how the code was constructed. And actually, there's a lot of fascinating information that is contained in that effort itself of the development of code. And so this is exactly what uh, Adam Tornhill explores. And so the idea is based on this very basic premise that the construction of code is cataloged in your Git repositories. Everything that you do in your Git deposit repository is cataloged and saved through history. So you can actually watch the development of a piece of software. And so there's a lot of very famous visualizations. I think one off the top of my head, there's a visualization of, for example, the Linux kernel, which shows how like the Linux kernel started as like a single node. And then it kind of out, you know, it kind of like multiplied and grew out uh, to, to show uh, the, the entire development cycle of the Linux kernel itself. And so these kinds of changes to your code base um, are very pretty looking for sure, but they also uh, elicit uh, a very important aspect on the way that the code was developed. And if you guys are familiar, of course, with that concept from, um, I can't remember exactly who uh, said this concept here, but, uh, oh no, of course, actually, I know this is Conway's Law. So Conway's Law, this is from, from Conway, who created, of course, the Conway Game of Life. Conway's Law states that the development, and this is a paraphrase, uh, the development of a system is dependent on the, the, uh, the, social, the social constructs of the people who are developing that system. So the famous example is that if you have a three-pass compiler uh, written by four teams, you're going to have a four pass comply compiler, right? Because there's a grouping of these uh, four separate uh, teams of individuals communicating with each other. And as a result, that communication stream causes enough software itself will uh, will dem will actually display this kind of um, these kind of uh, these kind of constructs. And of course, there's actually another concept uh, called the reverse Conway law, uh, re reverse Conway maneuver, where you try to st structure your organization in such a way to build the code uh, in better. Um, and I think actually you, you can actually see some of this in, for example, when Spotify was doing its guilds uh, or its, its its team constructs. You have these kind of like vertices of of like these different individuals who have this expertise uh, in different parts of the software. Anyway, there's a there's a lot of very fascinating theory in this architecture discussion on how people can create software, how you kind of communicate around software, and how you combine software. Uh, that's another topic for another time. I would love to get into that completely, but we'll probably just touch on a, a few aspects of that for now. Anyway, continuing here. So Adam Thornhill goes on to, to describe how you can extract data from your GitHub repository in order to find the code that matters. And so this is really interesting here. There are certain pieces of code, and this is exactly a demonstrative of Conway's, I mean, the, the Conway's law for groups talking to these, I mean, 
in charge of these separate different modules. And also, this is one of the reasons why the integration points between these modules that the teams create is so uh, right and bugs and et cetera. Um, and so this is how we can even try to uh, preemptively discover issues with our code. And I think that's actually one of the coolest things here is that the techniques that are described in this book help you identify places in your software and in your code that could potentially be causes of issue, causes of problems, and places where you would need to ex spend a little extra developer effort to ensure that that module is safe, working, uh, and tested. And so very, very fascinating stuff here. So let's go ahead and continue onward. So Conway, uh, you know, very, very famous for his game of life. Uh, Adam, this thing called like offender profiling here. Uh, and so he, he, the, 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 the corollary is that like with an offender, you can find these different places that they visit in like a city, right? You know that this person still has to sleep, still has to eat, so has to, you know, like lives in like this certain like around this area here. Uh, and so uh, in this case, for example, this is the uh, five murder locations uh, or, and graffiti locations in a particular city, in Middlesex in London, actually. And, oh, it's actually, this is a uh, Jack the Ripper. And so using this kind of information, you can start to figure out, okay, where are the potential you can do exactly the same thing with your GitHub repository if you can think of uh, bugs uh, and, and failures as your murders, right? So these are actually the quote unquote crimes. These are the, the crimes that happen in your code. Uh, and you can find the crimes, of course, like after the fact when you're doing your analysis after your system fails. Um, but not only can you find the, uh, not only do you want to find those bugs, but you want to preemptively address them. And so from Adam Thornhill's research, and so here's where it gets really important. Adam Thornhill's research describes how when a system has a particular file that is touched by multiple people at the same time, or, or not at the same time, but is mo modified by multiple people, um, often, that particular file is a suspect, right? It is suspect for uh, bugs, it is suspect for issues and errors. And that's because if multiple people are editing the same file, not everybody is going to share their brain state, right? There's a lot of things that implicitly that file is touching, right? Because if one person is working on a project, he's working on these files mainly. Another person is working on these files mainly. Let me go actually go back to this graphic here. Uh, one person is, is working on these files here. Another person is working on these files here. But then team members from both of the teams are touching a single file here, one that crosses the boundary between these two. That right there is cause for alarm because that file could potentially be influencing a lot of files inside of here or a lot of files inside of here. And as a result, that file um, could, uh, a change in that could break systems in either one of these cases. So that's the basic theory uh, behind uh, Adam Thornhill's, uh, Adam Thornhill's um, work here. Uh, and the book then goes on and describes his, his code, uh, but, uh, this is where it gets a little interesting. So uh, the way that I did this was after reading this book um, and looking at the code base, and you know, there's not anything too terrible with the code base, uh, but it's just the fact that it's it's a little bit out of date, uh, and it's also written in uh, Node and JavaScript. Um, it's still a very cool, you know, it's a cool it's a cool thing. It still works. Uh, here's the code base right here. It's called Code and Code Mat, um, and it's a it's a you know. It's a command line tool that's written in JavaScript. So, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about JavaScript for your CLI tooling. Uh, I'm not a personal fan, um, but yeah, you can take a look at it here. Uh, so what I did instead was I actually used a uh, framework uh, for data pipelining in order to adapt the code that was written here um, for like more 
you know, in a way that is more sustainable for uh, data analysis and uh, data integration. Because truth is, this is just another data integration problem, right? We're integrating data from your GitHub repositories and applying some analyses onto it in order to get a result. So truly, this is just another data engineering problem. And I'm a data engineer, so I'm going to solve it like a data engineer. Uh, so the framework that I used in order to solve this issue is a framework called Kedro. And so Kedro is actually a very fantastic framework. I, I super love it. I've been using it um, uh, since I joined Quantum Black. And the idea, the idea here is that Kedro was built based on the problems that we were, we were facing at Quantum Black whenever we would go to these different uh, organizations to do data pipelining for them. Every time we went to these different organizations to do data pipelining, we were running into the same issues. We kept rewriting the framework of this kind of like uh, infrastructure code as well as rewriting a whole bunch of integration code and then rewriting how we do our transformations, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and so Kedro came out as a distillation of all the problems that we faced when we were writing data pipelines. And so actually, uh, I, I didn't give you a little bit more intro. I, I used to work uh, also at Palantir. And so that's where I did most of my data engineering work uh, was when I was a forward deployed engineer for Palantir. They sent me all, you know, around the world. I went to all these different places doing this exact like data engineering story. Um, and I can tell you 100% from my personal experience, Kedro is the best piece of software that I've used for writing these data pipelines. Uh, it's it's a fantastic methodology because it includes with it um, a, a standardization, uh, easy access for uh, documentation, and a vibrant community of people that can you know, explain or elaborate or explore like how Kedro works. Uh, and a community that I actually run is the Kedro. Kedro. Highly recommend uh, you come by and uh, join up with our Kedro community, or you can actually check me out on YouTube where I talk about uh, Kedro. And so that's actually youtube.com slash data engineer one. So I actually I make videos on data engineering. So if you guys want to know more about this stuff, join me there on YouTube. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and take a look at our Kedro project. So one of the benefits of Kedro is that because it is a standard way to write data pipelines, that means that if you understand one Kedro project, you can understand all the Kedro projects. So I highly recommend looking at Kedro for sure. Um, and not only that, but if you understand the project and you can understand other projects, that means a machine can also understand your project or other projects. And so Kedro comes with several different um, um, uh, trans, uh, what's the word? Uh, transpiling tools, such as Kedro Airflow, where you can output your Kedro data pipeline as a Kedro Airflow, I'm sorry, as an Airflow pipeline, or Databricks, or Argo. We have a ton of different uh, integrations, Docker included. Uh, so you can easily uh, deploy whatever pipeline you create. And this is one of the biggest problems with pipelines, is that when you write them, they're almost always one-off systems. And so anybody who tries to look at your pipeline, or even yourself, if you try to look at your pipeline three months later, you're not going to be able to understand it. I can guarantee that from my own experience. But because Kedro is a standard template and a standard format, it allows you to easily look at your pipelines. And I'll tell you the truth, the pipeline that I'm going to show you today, I actually I wrote this back in February. Actually, like, like actually even in January before COVID even happened. Um, and so uh, I hadn't looked at this pipeline for literally months. But thankfully, because I had written it in Kedro, I was able to understand it and um, you know make it prime and pretty, uh, prim and proper for the talk here today. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this really cool tool called Kedro Visualization. And so this is a tooling that, that we have, which is uh, also open source that allows you to explore your data pipelines that you create. I'm going to hide this mini map here. Uh, and you can see this is already looking kind of like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a directed acyclic graph. So it's all like goes in one direction here. And this shows the steps that are involved in order to take your data from a Git repository, clean it up, 
transform it, and then output it into a, a file for your perusal. And so you can see here in this extraction layer, um, it, it just breaks down so clearly, right? I have this function called retrieve raw git. And so what this will do is it'll actually retrieve the raw git uh, um, output, the raw git log from whatever repository I pass in based on this repository path. Uh, once it takes that, that raw git, it's going to transform it into this thing and then in, in here and output it to this data set called raw git output. What's really cool here is that this concept of transformation and data set or node and data set uh, is uh, prevalent or is basically what Kedro runs on. So this is pure Kedro right here. Everything is a transformation. Everything is a data set. Even these parameters that I pass in, these are data sets going into this transformation function. So Kedro adopts uh, the, these ideas from uh, functional programming, where we separate uh, pure functions, which just do an operation, from impure functions, which are responsible for saving state or loading uh, or loading state. And so here we load the data and we save it. We, we use this transformation and we save the output here. Uh, the reason why this is actually really powerful is because if you have your functions as pure functions, if they don't require any kind of external state, that number one makes it easier to test because you can just create whatever, whatever data that you want for that function uh, to test on. And also number two, it makes it easier to collaborate. And that's one of the beauties of Kedro is that because the pipeline is segregated between these transformations and these data sets, it allows you to uh, collaborate with other people. Someone else can be writing this portion of the pipeline, someone else can be writing this portion of the pipeline, and then someone can be writing these portions of the pipeline, and you're not gonna step on each other's toes. So it's, it's, it follows all these great software engineering practices, uh, and it allows people to uh, very, uh, very quickly and easily get up to speed with your data pipelines and collaborate on your data pipelines. So the way that we do this uh, in this code here uh, is we retrieve this raw git um, co uh, logs. We retrieve it from the logs and then we push it over into um, this output, which we then parse. So we, we parse that output and we turn it into some tuples uh, that then does this aggregation, which will then generate what are called hotspots. And so this is going back to Adam Thornhill's work. Hotspots are the spots in code that have very long lines. This is his definition. He uses length of, of the file as well as amount of people uh, interacting with that file as a hotspot. So you, if you have a piece of code that is very large and a lot of people are interacting with, then you know that that's a risky piece of software because that piece of code is doing too much work. It's doing too much work. Uh, and as a result, because it's doing too much work, that means that it can potentially cause a lot of problems. So that's what these hotspots are. Uh, and so let me get, let me just uh, go ahead and share this portion of the screen so you can see what the code looks like here. And I have here a beautiful PyCharm um, IDE, where I'm showing off the different pieces of code that are in play. So Kedro, very easy. Um, it allows you to break things up into um, different pipelines. So a Kedro project can create have these different pipelines. And I have three separate pipelines here. I have an extraction pipeline, transformation pipeline, and a loading pipeline. The extraction pipeline, um, if we go explore it, uh, you'll see it's very simple. It's just retrieving the raw Git uh, as well as the raw uh, clock, the counter, the the line counting application from your repository path. So it takes this. You 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 pass in these strings that refer to uh, the what is with the data set name, which is then uh, located also inside of your catalog. And so Kedro again uh, allows you to abstract those impure functions as separate uh, entities, which you refer to using these names. Um, we can get into that a little bit later, 
Um, but for now, just know that we do an extraction operation where we extract from git and clock. We do a transformation operation where we're doing the parsing of the git and clock uh, uh, data, as well as the generation of the uh, revision aggregates, which is how many times a file has been revised, and then the hotspots based on the, number, the, the length of the file itself. And then finally, we load that data into this hotspots bubble packer. Uh, and so the hotspots bubble packer is a custom little data set that I wrote, uh, which actually takes a lot um, from the HTML output that the code mat had. And so the end result is something like this. When you run the guy, uh, let's go ahead and uh, open up um, Streamlit. So I'm actually using Streamlit to, uh, to, to, to make this guy run. And here it is over here. And I got to just change my screen share. be this guy here. And so this is the final output. And apologies for some of the formatting. I'm a data engineer, not a uh, front end developer. But as you can see, this is actually the directory hierarchy in this code base. And this particular code base is the hibernate code base. This is actually the example that Adam Tornhill uses in his book. Uh, but this comes from the Java, uh, you know, Java Hibernate ORM. So Hibernate is a, a tool for um, interacting with databases using an ORM. And already you can you can start to get an idea of what's going on here. So each of these these are these is, this is a bubble packer graph, and all of these uh, little subsections here represent a folder which contains these little colored ones, which are files themselves. And so you can actually click around in here to explore what it looks like. And so in this folder, for example, this one is the, oh, actually, I didn't really catch the name. But this is one of the integration folders, I assume. And if you go into that integration folder, you can see all the files that are located inside of this folder. And this file here, we have like a hierarchy, and this basic set with embed.java, detached, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what the bubble packer looks like. Now, the colors here represent its likelihood of being a hotspot. And you can see here, we got one that is red. Now, again, the hotspots represent, number one, how many people are touching a file. The more people that are touching a file, the more likely it's going to be a hotspot. Two, the number of lines of code. Uh, if it has more lines of code, that is also more likely to be a hotspot. So people, if there's a very long file that a lot of people are touching over a period of time, that represents a potential hotspot. And we can see we have one right here. If we click down, this is the abstract entity persister.java file. Now, the size of the circle also represents the size of the file. And you can see that this file is huge. This is an enormous file, abstract entity persister.java. It's a huge file. And because it's red here, we know that a lot of people are touching this file. So this is a candidate for a proper refactoring, right? Because what's happening here is that even though it's supposed to be an abstract class, and I don't, I don't know how, how familiar we are with Java, and I apologize because this is a Python conference, I know. Uh, but with Java, you have this idea of abstract classes, which are effectively just empty classes that need to be um, instantiated or that need to have their methods overridden in subclasses. Uh, and so like one example would be like an abstract shape object. And then you can calculate, you have a perimeter calculation that you would override, right? So you can have a shape that is like a circle shape. And then you have a perimeter formula that you that's right for your circles. Uh, and then you have a, a square shape and you have another perimeter uh, calculation that you need to write for that shape. Uh, and so that's what an abstract is, is that it's actually not the implementation, but really it's that prior portion that lays the framework for that particular um, for that particular file, uh, sorry, for that particular class uh, itself. And so seeing it as this large, uh, as this incredibly large thing means that this is an issue. Uh, so again, this is a candidate for your uh, refactoring here. Uh, and so that's actually the basic premise here for the hotspot analysis. 
Uh, and so the, the code here, actually, I'm using a Streamlit application. Um, this is a cool integration here where I'm actually integrating Streamlit with my Kedro pipeline. And so if we can go back to the code here one more time, I only have a few minutes left, so I just want to cover a few things uh, before we end it here. Stop the screen share, come back to the code. Um, and so the code, again, because of the way that we, the, the way that it works, it, it's very simple to see how um, Kedro has all of our different, uh, all of our different visualizations, I'm sorry, all of our different visualizations uh, for uh, how the pipeline is made up. Uh, and the way that this guy works is uh, you can, of course, integrate your Kedro pipeline into any application. And what I've done is I've integrated into my Streamlit's application. So I have here a Streamlit entry uh, Python file, and it's located right here, where I'm grabbing the after and before um, parameter values, passing them into my Kedro project, load context. And so load context is really just loading your Kedro project in a dynamic way. So I have access to the context. And then I can run the different pipelines that are available in that context. And in this case, we're running the uh, transformation pipeline with the tags of generate. Uh, and so those tags right here correspond to the pipeline here, um, the tag generate, uh, and this transform pipeline. And this one will then run this guy here, the generate git revision aggregates, which takes those parameters after date before date, and then generate hotspots, which will then take the revisions as well as the clock files um, and output those hot, hotspots for the bubble packer. Um, finally, what I do then is I load from that data. And so I have a custom data set that will not only create that bubble packing uh, HTML that we saw earlier, but will return that HTML, which I can then insert into our Streamlit application using the HTML component. Yeah. So that's a, a quick whirlwind tour of uh, how you can uh, use uh, Kedro, Streamlit, and um, Kedro, Streamlit, and uh, apply them to this book here, Your Code as a Crime Scene, to get such beautiful visualizations for you to understand your architecture. And again, this is a very fascinating topic. I think this is one of my favorites is how do we construct good software? How do we architect good software? Because really, it's a human problem. Uh, and uh, it's one that can only be addressed using human uh, methodologies. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I hope that that was good. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll, maybe I can toss it back to you, Jacob, and let me know what I can do next. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Tam. That was a lovely talk. I particularly like the infographic you showed there, or the graphic, even though you called yourself a not so full, I mean, front end engineer. It was a great way to visualize how, you know, you can identify bad, or, well, not bad, but like highly uh, use sections of your code, and that particularly caught my eye. So if you could go ahead, uh, join our Discord again, and help clear some doubts. You might not find a lot of people out there because it's 3 a.m. in UTC. No worries. So I, I would, if I were you, I would just wait there for a little while, and you'll find a ton of questions being you know, bombarded at you tomorrow morning, most likely. <laughs> OK, sure thing. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right.